Sar Shalom Ministries launches in 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You're watching Star TV. You're watching Star TV. You're watching Star TV. Estás viendo Star TV. Yes, there's gold to be found in the Word of God. Join us live every Sabbath at 1 p.m. Eastern for 15 minutes of golden nuggets from the weekly Torah portion. Gold tried in the fire. So remember, there's gold in them there scrolls. Shabbat Shalom and welcome to this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah portion is titled Bo, which means enter or go. It's the 15th Torah portion found in Exodus 10 and verse 1 through 13 and verse 16. Jeremiah 46 verses 13 through 28. Psalms 48 through 50. Luke 22 verses 7 through 30. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 20 through 34. The first scripture in this week's Torah portion starts off and says, And the Lord, Yahweh, said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh. So there's where you get this week's title is, Go in unto Pharaoh. And when you think about that, of what happens with all of this, of Moses going in unto Pharaoh, he's gone into him many times. But this Torah portion is starts out with this, and that's a strength you know, title of this, of this week's Torah portion. And when you think about that, sometimes go (laughs) means you're going into the fire, you're going into some trouble, you're going to meet resistance. And that's what Pharaoh represented was resistance. But when you think about resistance, when you're working out in the gym, they use resistance belts, you know, resistance bands, to make it harder to do a certain exercise because when you use resistance resistance bands, it strengthens certain muscles and makes the exercise harder than what it would be without the resistance bands. So when you think about it, when you are sent and said, go, go unto this resistance, go unto this Pharaoh, go is really, it looks like a very tough struggle. And it definitely, most definitely is a very tough struggle. And we know that Moses went through an extremely tough struggle along with the children of Israel. However, it was strengthening their faith and building up a beautiful faith story that we as believers are still enjoying unto this day. Hallelujah. Resistance builds strength. Just remember that in life. When you meet resistance, let it have its perfect work. Let patience have its perfect work. It's building strength. It's building muscles. It's building beauty in you. It's strengthening you. Amen. We don't always get to see exactly how it's going to happen. Moses didn't know exactly how it was going to happen. But you got to have faith and just listen to God and go with God. Um, It reminds me of this saying in 
um, Spanish is adios and it means, you know, people say it's like goodbye, you know, but in translation, it's go with God. And I think that's awesome. I just, I love that. So go with God, amen and amen. Sometimes you might be going into a resistance. You might be going into the fire, into trouble, but you're going with God because you're following his word. You're doing what he said. Go forth and walk in to your blessing. Amen and amen. If you keep on reading, there are a lot of beautiful goodies and amazing things in this Torah portion. I have to say that when I was meditating on this week's Torah portion, I thought about how it is, and I wrote it down, I just have to pull up my note. It's a kiss of Passover in the middle of winter because what we're in right now in this season, we're in the middle of winter. We're not, we're not in springtime. Springtime seems quite some time. I mean, outside it was like 20 something, something degrees today. I went for my walk like I normally do, but had to cut it short because it's so cold and windy. And I'm like, oh, winter is, winter's blowing. It's nice cold breath on us, but that's winter. But we get a little kiss of Passover, a little kiss of springtime in the midst of our winter as we get to meditate on this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah portion has the amazing story of Passover in it. And I'm going to try to read as much as I possibly can in the little time that I have with you guys. I want to flip to chapter 10 and verse 23. There's just a few scriptures I starred that I wanted to bring out. Um, This is when there were three days of darkness um, over the land of Egypt, but very key and important. In verse 23, it says, they saw not one another. So that's how dark it was. You couldn't even see a person. Neither rose any from his place for three days. And it says that the darkness could be felt. That's how thick this darkness was. Nothing that we've ever experienced. But the key in verse 23 is, is, God says, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling places. That's deep. That's deep. Even when there's darkness, God is your light. Amen. And verse 24, here we have go again. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses is saying, um, No, you must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord. Our cattle shall go with us. Moses is saying, no, 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 all of us, all, we're all one. Unity, unity, unity. No, 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 we are, nobody's being left behind. Amen, hallelujah. We're all going. So it's, it's not, it's, it's, this is a, this is not a, um, what is it? A compromise here. Moses is like, no, 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 we're all going, all going. We're all one. We're all going. So here we go again. Um, Now we've got another thing coming towards um, Pharaoh and his people because his heart was hardened. He's not letting the people go still, even though he said he was, but nope, he's not letting them go. So here we go again. Now we've got the death of the firstborn. Oh boy, here comes some more drama. <laughs> so you've got the death of the firstborn. And then you've got in the midst of this chapter of, well, kind of ending chapter 11. Now we're going into chapter 12. You've got, this is what I like to call the turnaround. Okay. The turnaround. So now you've got the turnaround here. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So now God switched it around. And now Nisan is the first month. So now he's made the change. He's made the turnaround. Reverse the curse. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Reversing the curse. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And you've got Lamb Selection Day. And we know that when Yeshua rode in on the donkey saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, all the people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. 
That was Yeshua being the lamb selected for us to be our very Passover. Woo, I just get so excited. I got to do a little Passover dance. Thank you, Yeshua, for being our Passover lamb. Hallelujah. And so you've got the instruction of taking the, the, the lamb for your household. God gives these amazing instructions. Um, blood is on the doorposts of your house. And then you've got the unleavened bread um, and, and the instructions on what you're going to be doing for this night. And if you look at verse 12, it says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. And the blood, everybody say, the blood Nothing but the blood. We thank you for the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. His blood speaks a better word for us. Hallelujah. Our past is covered in the blood. Our present is covered in the blood. And our future shall be covered in the blood. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for your amazing, whoo, hallelujah, your amazing blood. Thank you, Lord. So it says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses. We are houses. The Bible says that we are living temples. We are houses unto God, house of God. That is who we are. That is us. That is us. It says that it's going to be a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, hallelujah, and that's the, woo, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. That's the Hebrew word, 7,200. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Woo, hallelujah. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm trying to compose myself over here. Woo. I mean, how do you not talk about Passover and lose yourself in God? It's impossible. Thank you, Jesus. Passover in the middle of winter is what I'm having right now. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. Um, you know, the Hebrew word, you know, 7,200 provide amazing um hallelujah in verse 14 it says and this day shall be unto you for a memorial and you shall keep it a feast to yahweh throughout your generations you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever yes and yes and yes should we still be doing the passover absolutely we should still be celebrating yahshua's beautiful passover it says you shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. Amen and amen. And it talks about the, the holiness and the consecration of the feast and what you're going to do and eating unleavened bread in the feast. Oh, yes. And I apologize. Um, the word for token, the blood on your house is a token. That's the Hebrew word ot, an aleph, a vav, and a tav. It means signal, evidence, mark miracle those are some of the the definitions of it miracle is probably my favorite definition in mark that's what that blood is yeshua's blood it's a miracle and it's marked on us we're miracles hallelujah we're miracles he has turned our darkness into light he has turned and reversed the curse of sin and death we were destined to die but hallelujah God's amazing, powerful, ever-cleansing Passover blood speaks a better word for us, and it speaks light and life. Now we have eternal life. Hallelujah. Jesus, have mercy. Yeshua, we thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, moving on to verse 31, we have in chapter... 12. Now we've got the amazing title of this week's tour portion is enter or go. Now we've got Pharaoh saying go. 
first it was God was calling Moses and saying, Moses, you go. Now you've got Pharaoh saying to Moses, you go. So what is the word here? We are amazingly meditating on go. So now it says in verse 31, and he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get you forth from among my people, both you and the children of Israel and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone. So now you've got unity. Now you've got the oneness. Now Pharaoh's got it. Now we're going. Hallelujah. We are going as one. Hallelujah. Unity, unity, unity. It's what I'm praying over the body of Christ. Unity and love. Hallelujah. Passover unity in Yeshua's name. So now it says, also take your flocks and your herds as you have said. I'm in verse 32 of chapter 12 in Exodus. And be gone. <laughs> he said, get you forth. Go. <laughs> he said, and go serve the Lord. I love it. He said, go serve the Lord. And then he says, and be gone and bless me also. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then you've got, you know, here we go. Their departure they're gone. They get to go. They get to get all the, the, the riches. Um, they, they get, they um, spoiled the Egyptians as God said that they were. You've got, um, you've got jewels of silver, gold, and raiment. And the, and, and the Lord um, gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians, verse 36. And then you've got the trip um, the, the long trip begins, a mixed multitude went up also with them. Amazing. There we go. Mixed multitude. Um, Jacob's coat of many colors. Key here, we've got verse 42. Again, remembering how important Passover is. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of Yahweh to be observed of all the children of Israel and their generations. And we know if you are listening to this, we are all Israel now that we've come under the blood, under the banner of Jesus Christ, of Yahshua the Messiah. These amazing words, they are for you. And remember, in verse 49 of chapter 12 in Exodus, one law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. These aren't separate things for separate groups of people. It's one law. God has oneness. He's all about unity. This is all for us to do, all for us to shower our love back on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're here to shower our love back on our Passover lamb, back upon our Passover King in keeping this beautiful feast of Passover. We're celebrating our freedom. We're celebrating our salvation. It's a joy. What a privilege and an honor it is to be called to the marriage of the lamb. This is ours. This is for us. We are Yahshua's. We are Jesus's. We are his and he is ours. Enjoy celebrating the amazing festival of Passover on the inside of your being, rejoicing in your King, Yahshua the Messiah, the Savior of your soul. Just call on to him, call on his name, and you shall be saved. Hallelujah. He's got a beautiful promise, beautiful promise for you. Rejoice in your salvation and just know that you are loved. Know that you are loved. Passover is a kiss of love. This is amazing. Enjoying this Torah portion is a kiss of love and grace, a kiss of springtime in the midst of winter. And it's just time to rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. 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 And I wanted to leave you. I didn't get to go over everything that I wanted to. Um, and I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but I wanted to leave you with this scripture. Fear thou not, O my servant Jacob. This is in the prophet section, Jeremiah chapter 46 and 27. Fear, fear not, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar off. Hallelujah. I will save you from afar off and your seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob, also known as Israel, who we are, that's who we are. This is us. This is to us, 
shall return, say, I will return, hallelujah, and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. And it says again in verse 28, he says unto them again, fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, saith Yahweh, for I am with you. And he says he will not make a full end of us. Sometimes we think that we've just done too much wrong or we haven't done enough right or whatever that God's going to make an end of us and we're just done. But no, Passover in this beautiful Torah portion is a kiss of grace to you. God is not finished with you yet. You have a beautiful story. You've got to live out the rest of it. You might not know how things are going to go, but one thing we do know is in the end, it says God will be with us and he will save us. He will, Yahshua, God will save his people from their sins. He will pass over us and we will be able to sit in the beautiful table of the Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Wise and foolish. People that are wise give good advice. People that are wise always answer nice. People that are wise say kind things that make your tree grow good fruit and big and tall. People that are foolish say mean things and make your tree fall. He who is foolish thinks he will rule and does not understand that he is a fool. The wise are making people grow good fruit all around. The foolish are making people's trees fall to the ground. The people that are foolish betray God and are betrayers, and the people that are wise fight for God with their prayers. The wise only want the best. The foolish want more foolishness. The foolish are always getting angry fast. Some just won't let go of their past. The foolish, too, also have a second try. They can become believers and make trees grow and not die. But wise against foolish, wise will always win because God always beats sin. The wise are wise because they have God on their side. Between wise and foolish, wise they decide. The wise don't listen to the foolish people's lies. They trust in God and continue to be wise. But wise can sometimes turn foolish too. So if you're wise, don't let that happen to you. I'm just saying. Stop trying to run away. Have you ever felt stuck? Like you can't get past this obstacle that's blocking your walk? Like you just can't seem to make progress? It's as if something keeps holding you back from that place in your life where you feel you should be. Well, How about changing your perspective, how you view things? Try thinking differently about it. You ever think that maybe God is not finished with you in the place where you are? That maybe he's trying to teach you something in it, Paul? Something that might be a blessing not only for you, but for others? Some other child of God that he will have you share your testimony with, but you're too busy trying to run away. Sometimes he has to put his hand on your thigh, Jacob, to keep you from running. Some people are running away from God's calling, knowing he's called you to the ministry, and you wonder why you're struggling. Stop running. God simply has his hands on your life. When you realize that your steps are ordered, everything begins to make sense. When you know that your steps are ordered, Jonah, there is nowhere that you can run from God's hand. That pit you find yourself in, Joseph, it's there to bless you. That lion's den you've been placed in, Daniel, it's there to bless you. Those footstools disguised as your enemies all around you, they are there to elevate you. That giant standing in front of you, David, that obstacle is there to bless you. 
your blessing, your elevation is wrapped in your trial, in your obstacle. And God has you there to prevent you from leaving without your blessing. Your experience is in your struggle and your battle wounds, that's your growth. That's your proof to others that God can bring you out. Stop trying to run away from your blessing. Stand still and see what God is trying to show you because he won't let go until he blesses you. I'm just saying. Good Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to another 10-minute Tuesday, Gleaning in the Word of God. I'm trusting that all our prayers are being answered by Abba, therefore everyone is doing well by the grace and mercy of God. Tonight I want to take you to Genesis. It's going to be very brief. Chapter 3, the story of the temptation and fall of man. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of its fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And the rest of the story you already know, the beginning of the fall of man. What I want to just reflect on really briefly tonight is the fact that she took of its fruit and ate. The serpent could have spoken all day long. He could have said all kinds of things. She could have had conversation back and forth. But it wasn't until the action taken by Eve to reach out and take what was being offered to her. She reached out, grabbed it, and ate of it. Had she just been a hearer only, then none of the consequences of sin would have entered the world. But she was not just a hearer. She was a doer. She reached out, grabbed, and ate of the promises of the serpent. She was moved by the words of the serpent to eat. She was beguiled. She was tricked. She believed the lie. But it wasn't until she reached out, grabbed, and brung it to herself and ate of it and gave to her husband and he ate of it that the consequences of sin entered the world. He had to do the same thing. She could have just spoken all day, but he reached out and ate of what she had received. So essentially, words mean nothing. It is the action taken upon those words which opens the door to the consequences of our actions, be them good or bad. In this particular case, it was bad. Once again, I want to focus on take and eat. As with Eve, had she just listened to the words, there would have been none effect. She would have been a hearer only, but she acted on those words. She reached out and she took and she ate of the promises of the serpent by which the serpent deceived her. For God's judgment rules over everything. And God's judgment was, if you eat of this, you will surely die. The serpent like in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, exalted his word against the knowledge of God, which Eve should have cast down. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, as it is written, 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Adam and Eve had the knowledge of God. God said, do not do this. And then a separate source will come up with another idea, another gospel saying it's okay, contradicting God's word for his own and his own agenda saying here, it's okay. All foods are clean. A day is any day. No, the judgment of God has already been established and it cannot be revoked. And ultimately they realize that a little too late. The serpent beguiled me, tricked me, deceived me, and I did eat. And Adam did the same thing. God, the woman that you gave me, gave me this food and I ate. Right now, saints, there is a buffet of word, quote, from God that's being offered all over the place. People are being tossed to and fro, looking for something that's going to feed their flesh that sounds good to their ears, that looks good. Sometimes the things of God may not necessarily be pleasing to the eye and pleasing to the flesh because it is food for the spirit and not food for this flesh. We must be careful of what we are ingesting, what we are listening to. Make sure it lines up and does not contradict the word of God. Saints, just be careful. Use the word of God to prove whatever it is you're reaching out and grabbing and eating is truly the word of God. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 12 through 16. Yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Yeshua shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou have learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Eve had received the word of God she spoke it, but she did not apply it. She did not use it for correction when she should have. Just like Yeshua, when he was tempted by the serpent in the wilderness, he used the word of God for reproof and correction. It is our weapon. It is our sword against the enemy. Resist the devil and he will flee. Why will he flee? Because you won't be any fun for him. He knows he can't get anything past you. You keep the sword of God, which is the word, well oiled, polished and shining. It's not sitting on the desk somewhere collecting dust. You won't be able to pull it out of the sheaf. But as it is written in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeshua says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. But it will take action. The word of God will not just pop in your mind. You will have to, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15, study the word of God so that you can use it when you find yourself being tempted. Do I obey God or do I do that which is profitable for my flesh? Do I feed my spirit man or do I feed my flesh? Do I strengthen my spirit or do I strengthen my flesh, which wars against the spirit? No matter which side we take, we are going to have to take an action. My prayer is that we all choose to strengthen and feed the spirit and resist the flesh, that we reach out, take and eat of the tree of life. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, 
For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. This is the tree of life, which we should all reach out, grab and eat of the promises and the covenants of God, the word of life. As John 6, 51 says, Yeshua is the bread from heaven. And when we eat of his flesh, that Passover lamb, we have eternal life. Matthew 26 and 26, take, eat. This is my body. Reach out and grab the tree of life. I'm speaking to those whom the Father has drawn to Messiah. As John chapter 6 and verse 44 says, no one can come to Messiah unless the Father who has sent him draws him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is faithful. He is true. And he dwells in you. That where he is, there you shall be also. During these times of trouble, be assured that faithfulness walks with you. The Amen stands guard over you. The truth, which is greater, dwells in you. Remember to stay in the word, prove all things, and hold on to what is true. Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, are of a good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Shalom. May the peace of Yah continue with you. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. I hope your Sabbath is elevating and today's service a blessing. You know, God puts things and people in our lives that at the time we have no idea that in the years to come, that thing or person would ultimately cause us to bring glory to God. And the purpose would not be revealed until a particular season or until we reach a certain level of maturity and understanding in God's word for the revelation to be made manifest. The reason why that thing or that person was placed in our lives, no matter how long nor how brief. And when that revelation happens, you're going to say, wow, God, you were moving chess pieces in my life so that I could look back now and see that your hand was always on my life. He has a plan and a purpose. Though you may not understand it now, it will be made manifest in its appointed time when God feels the time has come for the revelation to be revealed. It's amazing. It could be little things, things you take for granted that God will use years later in your life to bring glory to his name. Some good experiences, some bad. But it is all ordered by God. We have plenty of people in the scriptures that has that same testimony. Again, something can seem trivial at the moment. But some 10, 15, 20 years later, suddenly he'll bring it to your remembrance and you'll have a revelation. All this time, God has been preparing you, grooming you, ordering your steps, your experiences, your traumas, your loss. Your gain, all things were ordered. Ask David, ask Jeremiah, Peter, Paul, I could go on. One of many personal experiences of mine is my testimony of the shofar. It was the first biblical item God put in my heart. 
I'll give you a little backstory. I was brung up Pentecostal. And back then, I knew of no one that even said the word shofar, let alone sounded one. And I'll never forget the words of the elder that baptized me. He told me that fasting is like a rocket ship to God's throne. Shortly after, I began to do a 72-hour total fast. I began reading the Bible beginning in Genesis all the way through. And it was some time after that that God gave me the shofar, the ram's horn. He also put it in me to start building a half-scale Ark of the Covenant. And although I didn't know it, I know it now, of course, both were directing me, pointing me to the feast days and the commandments. But of course, I didn't know that revelation back then. I guess they were more of a passionate fascination or or something I don't really know. But one thing's for sure, God knew. So like I said, the first thing he gave me was the ram's horn, the shofar. And I've never heard or seen one before except on television. I began to search for Jewish stores around the area and I found one in Cleveland Heights. So when I went there, I went in pretending like I knew what I was looking for and I knew, you know, what I was doing. I didn't want to seem like a newbie. So the store owner, he he was very nice and he showed me various shofars. Of course, all of that is revelation of God choosing who would be the instrument of his calling. Everything, man, everything, when you look at them through spiritual eyes, will bring glory to God. So I ultimately, I found one that was within my price range. Those things were expensive and I didn't want to try. He asked me, you want to try it out? I didn't want to try it out in the store because I didn't want to be embarrassed. I had no idea how to make it sound. I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe it's like a trumpet. So when I looked at it, I saw that it had the hole where the mouth would go, but I thought maybe it needs a mouthpiece or something. I don't know. No idea. Now, now, of course, you can laugh, but and you've never seen one before. You never had any idea how to sound one. It's totally new to you. And you would say the same thing. Everyone knows about a shofar now. So, of course, that sounds funny. But back then, it was not a thing. In fact, when I ultimately would bring it to church, folks complained about it. They laughed. People even thought of Vikings, you know. So, again, back then, people weren't talking about prayer shawls. It wasn't about Torah. You were hard pressed to find that. Sure, there were a few Messianic congregations, but not. it wasn't like anything today. Back then, it was more, that's for them. In Christian, traditional Christianity, that's for us, the Christians versus the Jews or whatever. And of course, all of that is ridiculous today. That's error. There's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's more to this that was really insightful, but I just want to get to the point. There would be maybe a couple of years later that I would begin to walk in Torah and keep the feast days. But like I said, now I can look back and understand why the first thing he gave me was the ram's horn, the shofar, followed by the Ark of the Covenant, which housed the Ten Commandments. The ram's horn, because it awakens us from our slumber. He was awakening me to his commandments, to his feast days. Back then, I had no idea. But now, like I said earlier, he will place things in our lives and people in our lives that we will not have the understanding at the moment. But later on, he'd give us the revelation. And that's exactly what he did with this. That shofar was God's way of letting me know that he had his hand on my life that he would restore his Torah. He would open up my heart, open up my ears to his word and to his truth. But of course, I had no idea at the time. He's given us the revelation of the shofar. We've done a teaching on it before. I think I'm going to post one online because this is actually something that needs to be visually seen. That shofar is each and every believer's testimony who begins to walk in Torah. He has to open up our ears, our hearts, literally raise us up from the dead with his voice, which is his word. Remember, his voice is like that of a shofar. And what was the sound that Israel heard when God gave them his commandments? It was the sound of the shofar, the ram's horn. And that's exactly what God was doing. He was getting ready to open up my heart to his commandments. 
we are the ram's horn that God chooses to cut off, right? The, the ram's horn had to be cut off from the ram, separated, right? Had to have its flesh removed, which is what Yah does with us. We have to remove our flesh so that the spirit, the breath, the wind, his spirit can flow through us, which ultimately causes the ram's horn to sound. And it's not our sound, but it's the ruach. It's the breath. It's the one who sends the mighty rushing wind that speaks through us. And of course, none of this I knew at the time. He was waking me up with the sound of the shofar, wanting me to hear his voice and return to Torah. It may seem insignificant to some, but it's amazing and very humbling. Saints, we have no idea where God is taking us. Each individual has a unique story. He places us in seasons and in places for his purpose. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't try and force God's hand. You may be thinking one way, but he's on a whole different level, setting you up for something that he's going to do way in the future. He is the author and finisher of our faith. We just have to know that he has this. He's the one that has the ultimate final say concerning our walk. No man, no woman, no lying devil has the authority to count anyone out or say that God is not using you or he won't use you or you're too this to be used or you're too that to be used. You're not old enough. You're too old. You're not holy enough. No man, no woman, no one has that authority except Yahshua himself, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one who prepares the way and orders our steps. We don't know the plan for our own lives, let alone someone else's. Those that are seem to be drifted away or whatever, who knows why God has them in that place? It could be for some purpose yet to be realized. We don't count them out. We pray for their strength. Who knows the mind of God? One of the biggest examples of this is Paul, the Apostle Paul's story. He went from a killer of the saints to one of Yeshua's biggest proclaimers. His epistles are the most read in modern Christianity. We are looking at the afterglow. We don't really look at the setup of Paul's life. We see him after Yeshua called him. But Paul's life, even the bad, was all ordered by God. So guys, don't count anyone out. Listen, if we honestly reflect back on our own lives, I doubt very seriously that we would call or choose ourselves. But I thank God for his mercy. I thank God for his kindness, for his grace. I thank God for his hand of protection and favor that in spite of our mess, he still chose us, even knowing the mess that we would do after being saved, after being called by his name. And yes, some willingly, but he still, knowing what we would do, gave us his spirit, still called us his own. Who can understand the mind of God? When God has his hand on you, it's from the beginning, from birth. Some of us can look back on our lives and say, wow, how am I still here? You can definitely see God's hand was on your life, preserving you and keeping you, ordering your steps. Each point, each station in our lives had a purpose. They were instrumental in raising us up to where we are today. And the journey is not over yet. You noticed our intro, you know, the rocket launch in the beginning. Well, after today, you're going to receive the revelation of it and you'll never see it the same way again. Listen, the intro rocket is made to rise up, to lift off, to climb high, to elevate beyond the earth, reaching into the heavenlies, just like you. That rocket is you. And as it's climbing, being lifted up by the fiery trials of our lives, being elevated by the heat of afflictions working for our good, its flames elevating us, being used as our footstools, for without it, we couldn't rise. We couldn't be lifted up 
without tribulation. Did you catch that? When is Messiah coming back for us? After the tribulation. Read Matthew chapter 24. God is so awesome that he makes our enemies our footstools, just like he's made death a tool for salvation. Hear me out. Without death, which we see in the flesh as a bad thing, Messiah couldn't have saved us. He had to die and be elevated, lifted up, risen again in order to save, as the scripture says. Had Messiah not risen, we'd still be in our sins. But what had to come first? He had to die. God uses it as a footstool. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies, which he makes my footstools for elevation. But our flesh can't comprehend that. When we understand God's perfect love and that he has all things in his hand, fear becomes a distant, laughable memory. It will have no power over us. So as that rocket is climbing, something amazing begins to happen. Sections of it begin to fall off. These are called stages, parts of the rocket that once its purpose is fulfilled, they will fall away or fall off. Their season, their purpose in our elevation is fulfilled. It's complete. Then another stage takes over to elevate us even higher all the way until we reach the promise. Each station, each season has a purpose and its job is to get us to the place where it was designed to get us. And when it's completed, this too shall pass until we reach the goal, the promised land, our place where we are seated in heavenly places. But in the meantime, strap in, trust the designer and builder of our faith and know that this ship, God is in control of it, Houston, and it's fueled with the Holy Spirit. And Yahshua is our pilot. He's at the helm. So saints, just hold on from station to station, knowing that your steps are ordered. And oh yes, it's a bumpy ride. We're trying to break through the atmosphere and the chains of gravity is trying to hold us back, fighting against us. But once we break through, is going to be smooth sailing. No more chains. We are free from the atmosphere. And that's when we have matured in the understanding of his perfect love. Look for revelation in your life. I guarantee you, you'll find it. Things don't just happen when you're a child of God. And if you have not accepted Yahshua as your savior, today's the day. Did you know that he did most of his healings on the Sabbath? Today, he wants to heal you. Open up your heart, lift up your hands, and accept the gift of salvation. Yahshua, Yah is our salvation. He will save, He will deliver. Yah, whatever's going on in people's lives right now, Father, touch them, strengthen their minds, strengthen their hearts. Let them understand that their steps are ordered by You. You hold our futures, You are the author and finisher of our faith. We thank you for all that you are doing in our lives today. We thank you for each day, our daily bread. We praise you. We lift you up, Father. In the name that is above all names, Yahoshua Hamoshiach, Jesus the Christ, Yah bless you and keep you. Yah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yah lift up his mighty countenance upon you and grant you his shalom, his peace. Bashim Yahshua HaMashiach Hasar Shalom, in the name of Yahshua, the Prince of Peace. Amen and Amen. Shalom Aleichem, peace be with you and yours. During these uncertain times, coupled with the inability to fellowship together at our place of worship. It can really take a toll on our weekly contributions, especially for a small fellowship like ours. That's why I wanted to say thank you for your faithfulness. 
Though some have turned to the practice of out of sight, out of mind, God has kept your heart in favor with us. Toda Rava, thank you very much for remembering Sar Shalom Ministries with your continued contributions. Your continued faithfulness assures that we will have a place of fellowship to return to. Contrary to what some may believe, we still must continue to pay our rent, even though we're not there. So from all of us at Sar Shalom Ministries in Garfield, Ohio, thank you for your continued support. Thank you for your faithfulness. In times like these, it will not be forgotten. As always, thank you for your prayers, your patience and support as we venture through this new medium on our YouTube channel. And I look forward to seeing each and every one of you real soon. Shalom.